Awesome. Well, this Sunday, um, well, actually, I'm sorry, this September is the fifth year anniversary of the passing of a great New York poet who I have to thank for making me uh, make the decision to become a writer in the first place. This piece is entitled On the Passing of Jim Carroll. That which does not heal cuts in the other direction. And Jim, you crawl through the slit on Christ's side only to be bled into a city of junk and art where you slept at the Chelsea Hotel or worked the desk at the factory. The sick morning can finally relax its hand from your throat in this, the season of your passing. Now that your keyboard has grown silent, even the air weeps, not being able to taste your words, which were precise, somehow delicate, but no less savage. I know that you dance among those stars in a New York sky, hidden by the light so far below, from 42nd Street, Astor Place, Alphabet City, or Chelsea. But now your words come down like rain in the pages of a novel not yet released or a performance is forgotten on your last show at the bottom line. But each mind that knew you or your art will turn back on themselves that you have passed from view like the last fruit fly in the early morning sunlight. This piece is actually one that I've writ, uh, read several times. It's actually dedicated to all those wonderful people we lost because of gentrification. <laughs> it's called Sold Streets. Did you know that the city only exists in the eye of the projector? Its film is becoming far too thin and ready to crumble, and the streets are sold. The projectionist is on the way out now. He found an eviction notice on his door this morning. The queen, or the beauty queen of Glamour Magazine, 1983, now lives under the scaffolding of 91st Street beneath the thumb of AIDS. But the tides of good fortune could not carry her away far enough far, uh, from the streets and sidewalks and rooming houses, which are exposed when the pools of fame run dry. Now she wears the face of disease which came on like beauty's final curse, as vicious as a female praying mantis on Broadway. Here ruin presses against the skin, leaving its mark like a fingerprint on still glass. Under the watch of Millionaire's Row of West 86th Street, the Dexter House does not sit quietly. Its children know only night, waking at four in the afternoon, to walk as silent shadows who pass by on Riverside Drive to sustain the winds of, off the Hudson River which beats against their sides as an invisible friend. Most live with winter in their hearts as the disgrace of landlords running unchecked grows as a decaying threat while others perform at penny arcades. All have given up looking for something to keep clean in cleansing fire. Those who live behind these section doors are often forgotten by time while replacing sleep with the voices down the hall where bathrooms sit open, waiting for the next casualty. Wanda is frantic now, looking for the soul that she lost in a downtown Brooklyn bar where it still lies stained by the boots of the, those squatters she once laid. In the side of the city, empty storefronts sprout like cattails over a polluted heart with for rent signs pressed against their windows. Housing court has become a collection agency for the landlords. Judges are nothing more than overpaid clerks. There is no defense for SRO tenants, working class regular apartment tenants, squatters or Section 8 tenants. Witnesses to the crimes of iron jaw landlords pass by with deep-seated contempt or fish-eyed indifference, then vanish from memory as they reach the end of the set.
Uh, this piece is actually entitled, Everything You're Looking For Is Sitting In The Room Right Next To You. There is nothing behind, <clears throat> there's nothing behind closed and silent doors where the air is still thick and the sun shines through the window like a stripper who dances at 12 p.m. on a Monday afternoon with no witnesses looking on in the dark. <laughs> Um, this piece is entitled The Silent Screen. All the porn houses are closed down now. Projectors stare blindly into the vacant theater like an empty gun with no more images left in the chamber. As the film finally snapped from the pressure of those streets, wiped clean of all memories of those who died just to keep it all together. Those faces have vanished into the silent screen. They are the marks that sit at lunch counters with coffee-stained napkins, always waiting for the game of chance. All shows canceled. All the young women who loved old and lonely men are now gone with retirement plans and full benefits. They no longer know the neon signs that read private booths in back. There are no award for there are no award shows for the naked theater, only a pass to the tombs. All the ideas have become too ordinary and accepted. Artists now live above the streets, no longer willing to dance through the metal doors of the psych wards, where angelic ideas are born in sanitized halls. You don't have to show me where to go. I know the routine. I'll be here long after you're gone. The academies have castrated the word, turning all meaning into a blue mist of barren winter on the written page. It's all advertising now, dead images of beauty's final curse. The brown snow of the east continues to whitewash the crime which the city was built on. The Wall Street deals, the back room deals, the racetrack deals, the under the table deals, the offshore deals, turning housing court into a collection agency where judges do the work of filing clerks. Do you know the stories that sit on the curb in garbage bags from rooms with eviction notices on SRO doors, working class doors, coffee house doors, and tenement doors, and do the doors of ghosts which no longer shatter under the pressure of putting on a good performance in a booth on the other side of the glass. Now they perform under the Hudson Moon, just beyond the reach of old men, who will forever feed $10 bills into slots and sit on plastic chairs, waiting for the show which never begins. Only the truly, truly wealthy can afford to forget what has already been buried in St. Luke's, or Pottersfield, or Fresh Kills Landfill of Staten Island. New York. Once the city of misfits now sits like an empty storefront with for rent signs pressed against the glass or the last great porn star presenting herself to those lined up on the other side of the camera. Wow. Thank you. Uh, this next piece is entitled Fly Paper. What are they doing in the Dexter house with their flypaper fancies, stuck in the buzzing mind of three days without sleep, waiting to go to housing court to face the judge to be betrayed again? Who are you willing, who are you who uh, will, are willing to look into their eyes and call them ghosts of the tenements that the city sleeps to wipe clean with extinction Come, uh, which comes on the wings of the seasons, which bury us under. Will those who come after recognize your remains from theirs, which, uh, with currency rotting in the human groin, buried under the concrete 
which is void of any past, or stuck in rooms smaller than the inside of Joe Frazier's swollen nose. Their passing is the extinction of the city, where even the hangers-on can no longer afford a room at the Chelsea, where Japanese tourists come to see a ble uh, city bleached of history. Who among you have learned the art of losing well to overcome the tensions that splits the mind in two, and the newborn skin of heaven and hell falls from view on 86th Street, but never underestimate the lightning of their minds that rise <clears throat> to their young revolutionary hearts, that overcome the buzzing fear that they are the new Indians in their broken down bathrooms where even the shock to the senses will not wipe clean from their rooms. Twisted abbots sit alone with gangrene in the leg, but they will not be digested into the rotting gut of the city to be shit out on the streets like another band of American refugees or vanish in the final frame that festers in the sewers where the other half have left their footprints. If management survives, then something much greater has died. Hold on, let me see. I think that's it. Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> Um, this piece is entitled La uh, Coney Island's Last Stand. No tickets have ever, uh, no tickets were ever taken here at the end of the queue line where prostitutes split in two from the pressure of choosing a new way to lose. All rides keep you going in circles or heading upwards until you hit your peak, then head straight down past the turnstile into the concrete heart of the animal of consumption where bloodied fingers beat against bleached walls void of graffiti, or a past which is not of New York but is New York, whose architects know nothing of the garbage heaps of the paupers' graves. Here both are the same for the human wreckage. The sideshow fancies are swallowed into the brown snow, uh, brown snow soul of the East Coast and melts into the carnival's last gleaming. The new Indians stand against the oncoming tide that comes to wash them out of shared bathrooms like the aborted flow of ghosts of the SROs or the saint of the Dexter House that learned the art of night diving onto the reservation of Queens or washed into the waters of the Hudson down onto the shores of Coney Island among the tapestry of newspapers, used condoms, syringes, right into the eye of the storm of human waste to be buried in the last lights of the People's Park. Oh, That's two minutes. Two minutes? All right, I have enough for one more piece. This piece is actually dedicated, actually another, the September's the passing of a, Another person who was important in my uh, life, this one's dedicated to a friend who succumbed to one last act of desperation. It's called Walking in Central Park with You. I want to walk in cent I want to walk through Central Park with you, not as lovers. I'm suddenly too young for that now, that your distance is far too great. Even when we were in bed together, you were two feet away, but miles out of reach. That distance was always going to take the form of a straight razor, which you used to cut away your gravity so you could drift through those waters of the gray seas, off uh, of, excuse me, the great seas of all your future plans. It's 1138 in Midtown Manhattan as I write you this letter. And already my thoughts of you have come on the waves of of my fear and trepidation, which is usually kept at low tide by Prozac. Your ghost is always white as snowdrift, not in New York where all the snow is black from the passing cars or the latest construction uh, work, more like Washington State or Minnesota or Germany, where they do a better job at hiding their excesses. It's not so unlike being at our apartment on Lee High Street where you needed to be held tightly with your head pressed firmly against my shoulder. It's true that the taste of coffee was not enough to keep you around. What time is it 
where you fade into the lightless theaters where all your indignities dance in mockery. I wanted to walk your movements in the grips of troubled sleep more than any noir film shown three in the morning. But you should have known that the body is borrowed and never owned. It's a rental with no option to buy. We are only visiting. And where did you think you were going to land before being shit out of the wards? Did you really believe that you were a saint or think that you, would, that you could tame the ascending wilderness which you feared would consume the idol of your name? When you couldn't even tame your own perfect skin or claim your body as your own? Those antidepressants could have tamed your indignities, but you embraced that fate, uh, fateful morning when you reached the end of your line. Those flames of the incinerator licked your perfect skin and hair as your body lay in the shadows of ruin, which you perfected as an art form or a well-planned assault. I still think of the great dust that was your beauty. Did you think you were going to get an applause after your silent exit? Those flames sent up smoke signals letting us know that you finally knew when to leave. That was your great escape, to avoid living in the circle life of a shut-in. Rooms, after all, can become rooms of drywall if you stay too long. I know you, so I know you sewed those tears together to form a hair shirt which you wore to wipe all of your indignities or to wipe away all your indignities of being born too late. You should have known that this was not going to be the closing night for your show of shows when the applause died down and all that remained was the reverberation of your frantic mind and the promise of your escape and the end of the aborted time or the, I'm sorry, the end of the aborted tide from the tyranny of time. Thank you. Thank you.